So CSS, again, this is going to be a very basic intro to CSS. It's just going to be kind of the, the basics that you need to know to get through the weekend uh, with tic-tac-toe. We're going to talk a lot more about CSS as the course goes on, especially when we get to next week and talk about Flexbox. So basic layout of stuff on a page is we're going to be using Flexbox for that to determine where elements are located. We'll talk about parent containers and how to organize stuff on a page effectively using Flexbox next week. So don't get super wrapped up in this CSS. This is more like how do I change the the color of something? There's some very basic stuff about like centering and alignment in here, but a lot of that is going to come once we learn Flexbox. And I will say the the if you are like me and loathe doing styling, um, I will help you through it because I'm the first one to tell you that I hate hate styling things, uh, or at least I used to because I sucked at it and. The only way that you get better at things like that is by practicing. And my advice for you is to embrace the um, the unit one project and pick something that you have the opportunity to style if you feel that that is something that you have a weak point with. Um, when I wanted to actually like, I I know how to, I know how all the stuff works because I have to teach it, but like I don't I'm not good. At doing it on my own. I just like when I build a website, I built something that's really simple and don't really, I'll use frameworks that already exist to handle the CSS for me. And I've stopped doing that now in an effort to try to get better at CSS myself and like have a better eye for design. And it's made a huge difference. And the one thing that made a difference for me was picking something that I know what it looks like, like Wordle. I picked Wordle. Wordle was my game too. Like I know how to code the logic for this because I've been teaching this stuff for years and it's not hard for me anymore. So I picked a game where I could write the logic and have fun with it and then learn how to do all the CSS stuff like from scratch. So I built Wordle for fun and said, I'm going to make this look exactly like Wordle on the website. Like when you play Wordle, I want it to look exactly like that. I want the transitions to be the same. I want the colors to be the same. I want the spacing and layout to be the same. I want the keyboards like the key, I want the keyboard to look identical. Um, and that's how I got better at it is pick something that you enjoy doing and throw in the stuff you don't like doing with it to try to make it more palatable. Right. Um, that's, that's how you learn this stuff. So as I go through this and like, as we go, through, especially with the more advanced CSS stuff, if you feel like you're not really inclined to this and like, don't like doing it, that's okay just practice it and you'll get better at it. The more you practice it, the better better off you'll be. Um, that's kind of the other thing is that I always use David as a crutch for CSS. Like when we write apps together, it's let me code the back end. You work on the styling and the front end. And, you know, if you have somebody like that, you should tell them like, I need you to push me and like make me do CSS every now and again, uh, because that's what's going to help you get better at it. So you'll all have an opportunity to do fun CSS stuff in the course. Um, but anyway, let's get to it. So we're going to add styles to a web page. Uh, we're going to use selectors to target elements for styling, and we're going to write some very basic CSS rules. Okay, this is the same lesson that we used. So we're going to stay in here. Okay, we're going to use the same directory. The only difference is that we need to make a CSS directory and a style.css file. Okay, so here inside of this directory, you'll see that we have. Um, our JS directory with our app.js file that we're not using. So sorry about that. Um, but we're going to right click here and we're going to click new folder. Okay. And that new folder is going to be CSS. Okay. Um, and then uh, Jurgen, you got that uh, question. On it. Cool beans. Um, inside of the CSS directory, we're going to make a file called style.css. Okay. We could do that in the terminal, but it's just as easy to do it right here. Awesome. Let's go to the lesson. This, I think, is where we don't have instructions for linking it. Yeah. Okay. So part of the setup needs to be linking the CSS sheet to our 
uh, whatchamacallit. So we're going to need to add, add a link component and set it up as follows. Good. And what we're going to do here is in our index HTML, we're going to need to make this work by setting up some basic boilerplate. Okay. Add basic boilerplate and a link tag in your HTML index.html. It needs to be orange and bold and set it up as follows. Okay. So what we're going to do is inside of our HTML file, we're going to delete everything we've got. We're going to put our boilerplate, so exclamation point tab, and we're going to add a link tag. Okay. So link is how we put a CSS, uh, how we link a CSS style sheet. Okay. Notice that we've got a bunch of different options here when I type link. Okay. We're going to pick the CSS one. So I click on that. And you'll see that we've got a couple things here. We have link, rel, style sheet. This is saying that the we're, relationship of the thing that we're linking is a style sheet. That's correct. But you'll notice here that our href or URL to the provided resource is not correct. Okay. Who can tell me what's wrong with it? I'm going to go like this so you can see what we've got going on here. What's wrong with this href? We need to indicate it's in a folder. Correct. Right now, we're saying with this href, which is the default when you just tab autocomplete like that, that this style.css is at the same level as index.html. It's not. It's inside of a folder called CSS. So what we're going to do is we're going to delete that. And we're going to say in the current directory with the dot slash. And you'll notice that that pops up a little shortcut window to say, oh, cool, CSS. Is it in the CSS folder? So we're going to hit tab. And when we do that, we'll see that it automatically detects that there's a file called style.css. So we can just hit tab again. Okay. So this is what your style or your thing should look like. I'm going to put this in the style sheet. Okay. That's how we link a style sheet. Technically, we should, if I am correct now, be able to use live server. So if you shut that down and start it up again, I'm guessing that this is going to work now because technically we have all of the parts we need. So let's try it out. H1 tacos. Oh, thank God. We have autocomplete back or auto refresh. Cool. Excellent. Did anybody need any help getting that set up? Super happy to help if you do. All right. Let's do it. So we'll talk about the history of CSS, what it is, basic syntax, uh, intros to a couple basic properties, um, and then some styling stuff, OK? We'll get as far as we can through this. Um, I have 45 minutes. I'm not going to rush. Whatever we don't finish, you can read up on your own. Okay. Because a lot of this is just going to be kind of a recap from stuff you had in the uh, pre work anyway. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll skip the, I'll, I'll skip the style or the, the history. Okay. We can just talk about the important stuff. Um, so CSS is a web tech that is used to format and style HTML and prov uh, provide stylistic behaviors using CSS animations. We're not going to talk a ton about custom CSS animations. I'm going to show you how to do a couple things, um, but a lot of the animations that we're going to use are actually going to be provided from third-party libraries, especially in unit one. So there'll be a, an optional lesson on that. It's some actually really cool stuff, like how to add cool animations to your website with very, very little work. Um, 
and that really it adds a nice like flair to what you're working on like for example um um if we look at uh tic tac toe um something like this okay this is tic tac toe that i actually built when i was in the cohort and the way that this works is when you load the page for the first time, you get these fun little animations that like scroll into the page. Like it looks like something like that would be difficult, but it really isn't. It's a couple lines of code um, because we take advantage of cool third party libraries. There are a lot of really cool things that you can do um, as far as that goes, like hover effects. Like you'd see when I hover over these that things, different things happen. Um, Turn your volume down real quick. I don't want to deafen anyone. This is going to be loud because I didn't know how to control volume when I took the course. So when I, I can pick a couple different colors. Let's go rock chalk Jayhawk colors. Um, X -O -X -O -X -O you win. Okay. So and it, confetti, fun stuff like that. I'm going to teach you how to do all this stuff. Okay. Um, you get a bonus if you use confetti in your tic-tac-toe game. But see, what I'm meaning to show you here, it, this indicates that the game is over. Like when I try to hover to pick another piece, it shakes like, no. Okay. You can use CSS for really cool stuff like this, where you're able to, um, you know, indicate to the user something that couldn't just be indicated with text somewhere. And it's a really good way to add some spice to your applications without a ton of work. Um, so it's definitely something that should be at the forefront of you know your design process. Like maybe not your design process, but your I'm done with my app and I want to make things better process. Okay. You'll get done with it and you'll be like, what can I do to make this better? Right. The game is over. When I hover over it, let's make it so it shakes a little bit and it indicates to the user that the game is over. Little things like that go a long way in applications like this and are definitely things that you should think about. Um, same thing. Like if we look at Wordle, uh, yes, yeah, where is it? Uh, yep. GitHub.io. There it is. There it is. So this is, this is how I practiced CSS. Okay. I picked Wordle and I rebuilt Wordle using, um, it looks a little different than this. I played around with uh, mobile responsive disk too, but I picked the same font. I picked the same colors, like the same animation, right? Like everything works the same. If you want to learn CSS, pick something that you are going to have fun building and then use that as an opportunity to learn how it works. Okay. And then add fun stuff to it, right? My Wordle has five difficulty levels that I'm pulling words from every single five letter word in the English language. So some of them are fun. Some of them are not fun because they're words that you've never heard of before. But like, have fun with stuff when you build it. That's the key to making a good project, is pick something that you want to build and that you're going to have fun building. Uh, anyway, um, your CSS will continually develop over time with each front-end project you're involved with. Please do not plan on being a CSS whiz the first time you do this. It's going to feel like you're a newborn deer walking and like, like it's going to feel like that when you first start writing CSS and that's normal. Okay. CSS, the first time you do it, you're, you're going to look at some people who have done this before. You're going to look at their projects and be like, holy shit, that person's project is what am I doing here? Look at that. That's so good. And I'm hobbling around over here like a little baby deer, right? That's okay. Some people have had practice with CSS before and are going to make astounding looking things. The goal here is to get something out of it and to learn you know, how to build this stuff and get better every time you do it, okay? Everything you build should be better than the last thing you built. And that's what you should take away from CSS, okay? Don't judge yourself according to others or comparing yourself to others. All right, let's start by testing the, our link out to make sure our link even works in the first place, right? We linked our CSS to this style sheet. Did it work, okay? And a good way to do that is to go into your style CSS sheet and add a rule for the body. And for our body tag, I'm just gonna make the background color. Um, let's go with cornflower blue. And it should show up as whatever color you pick there, okay? Cornflower blue is a visually satisfying color that indicates security and 
networking and friendship and uh, it's why Facebook and tw well, I guess Twitter doesn't exist anymore, but whatever the hell they called it um, or X it used to be blue because it had it in, this color invokes feelings of um, uh, whatever. I don't know. I, I don't know all the touchy feely stuff. There's a here, CSS. You have all the touchy feely, and I yeah. only treat black, so I don't know. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. There's a, a feelings. There's, it's like CSS has um, brand name. Maybe it was brand name colors. Here it is. Okay. This is the color emotion guide, which I know sounds silly, but like strength. Okay. These are strong brands. These are environmentally friendly brands, even though they're oil companies on here, right? This The, the colors that these brands evoke are meant to make you feel good and make you feel happy or things that like there's excitement. Okay. That this is science. Okay. This is actually how this stuff works. Um, and it's really, really cool to see this in apps, right. With dependable trust. These are apps that you can trust. Um, it's just kind of cool to see this. So, yeah. I love that they put Hooters and Nickelodeon right next to each other. That's really funny. Um, but anyway, fun stuff. There's a whole bunch of psychology that goes into colors like this. And like the reason that certain sites have certain colors is not just like some person thought it would be cool. It's there's oh, so much, it's so much science behind it. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But anyway, cornflower blue is cool. That was my point in that. So the basic syntax of CSS rules looks like this, okay? There's going to be a CSS selector. There's going to be a property and a value inside of that selector, okay? A property and a value together are called a declaration, okay? So here we have H1, color orange, text align center. Let's see what that looks like, okay? Let's put an H1 in here that says uh, this is supposed to be orange. And then we'll make it orange. Okay, we'll go into our style sheet and I'm gonna add a rule here. I'm gonna make this easier to read. We'll say H1 and we open curly brackets, okay? We're getting linting here right now because it says do not empty use empty rule sets, okay? VS Code's trying to get our back. We tab in once and we're gonna say color orange. And you'll see that our text turns orange. We can also do text align center. Okay, what that does is it aligns our text in the center of whatever little container element it is. In this case, our, since this is an inline element, it's or a, a block element, it spans the entire page. So when we do text align center, it centers it. We're going to learn much better ways to center things when we talk about all of this in uh, Flexbox lecture. Now. Um, seeing semicolons automatically pop up, and you had mentioned in um, went during JavaScript that you don't actually need them. Is that is that only apply to JavaScript? And, and thank you. Yep. Have to use them in CSS or bad things happen. I wish I didn't need them, but yeah, you absolutely need them here. Okay. So selectors are used to target the elements that we want to style and range from very simple like this to vastly incredible and complex. Okay. Um, multiple selectors can be specified, in which case a comma would separate them. So if we wanted to specify two things here, like H1 and H2, I would put H1 comma H2. Okay. Um, properties. There are a few hundred CSS properties that can be used to style color, size, text, position, border, animation, and tons more of different elements. Okay. The value is whatever the value we want for that specific property. Okay. The property font family accepts values of font names like Georgia, Helvetica, etc. Okay. 
Other properties might have numeric values and a type of unit assigned to them. So if we wanted a border, uh, I can show you this. Let's do border and we'll say um, three pixels, okay? And that puts a three pixel border around this, but we have to be more specific and say solid uh, fuchsia. Okay, now we have a three pixel solid fuchsia border around our H1. Okay, I kind of love that. It's like RuPaul colors, it's like the orange and the pink. It's good stuff. Cool. Int unintentionally building a drag queen app. I love it. Um, so the declaration here is the combination of a property and a value. This is a declaration. Okay, and ends it with a semicolon. So there's some basic properties here, okay? Content, padding, margin. Font, we're gonna talk about all this. We're gonna talk about font all over the place when we actually talk about like Google fonts and how to use Google fonts and how to add custom fonts. So we're gonna kind of squeeze by this for a second without really spending a ton of time on it. Not you're not going to need to adjust a ton of fonts between now and when we talk about how to use Google fonts. So I'm not going to put a ton of time into talking about it. Okay. Let's say we want to change the font here. Uh, we'll say font weight bold, and you'll see that makes it a little bit bolder. Okay. If we comment that out, uh, technically this isn't doing anything uh, because the font weight for an H1 tag is already bolded. So let's, let's pick something like a P tag for an example here. Let's put a P tag in here that says, um, let's go with the drag queen theme and say, uh, it's another day in the workroom. Technically workroom, right? Um, and let's select that P tag and go ahead and font weight bold. And you'll see that that bolds the font. Okay. And we can turn rules on and off by commenting them out and commenting them back in. We can control the size of the font with font size and say either one of these options where we have specific things set for us. So we can be specific in the pixel size. Okay, 12 pixels is going to look like small. And if I want to make it massive, I can make it bigger. Let's make it 48 pixels. Yeah, that's a big old P tag, right? Um. How do you know what font size to use? Okay, there are weird specific rules that we're going to talk about. Um, this is usually where David shines in this lesson because he's he knows all the numbers to use. And typically, you're going to see things built out in increments of eights. Um, and there's a reason for that that I don't know. And maybe I can get him to come and guest lecture sometime and talk to you about the number eight. But there's a reason why things are usually in increments of eight, and I, I'll I'll look it up and I'll get back to you uh, on that because it's it's it has to do with like proportions and it's fun stuff. But um, do what looks right for your application. That's the best advice I have. You don't need to use specific numbers. I absolutely will not be looking for specific numbers, um, but you should definitely be looking at um, uh, whatever looks best for your site. And the other thing that you'll learn how to do is when we make things mobile responsive, you'll learn how to change that size dynamically based on the size of your page, which is what you really want, right? You want something that's going to scale to fit the size of the application that you're building as it gets bigger and smaller. Did y'all hear a beep? I'll leave my headphone off my ear a little bit. I just heard a weird high-pitched beep. Um. We can also change the font family. Let's do Helvetica. Okay, and you'll see here that we can change that so that we have different font families. It's just, you can do that. Okay, there are so many fonts that are built into the, the browser. Um, that's, those are things that you have the ability to change. I will teach you how to use Google fonts once we get to the Taylor Swift lesson. That's an optional part of the Taylor Swift lesson. So we'll go over that then. Okay. One thing I do want to mention when you're picking colors for things like this, and this again is something we're going to talk about later, but let's say the background color for this was also or uh, fuchsia, right? For this component. And this is obviously hard to read. 
But if I want some input as to how hard this is to read, there's actually a way to quantify that. And if you go use this little inspector tool, this wand, um, and you click on this or hover over it, you'll see that the accessibility settings are down there. It says accessibility contrast is 1.58, okay? That's bad. That's why it has a little exclamation point next to it. Like, yo, this is not accessible, okay? I will be looking at this in your applications. And if you have anything that is not accessible, I'm going to make you fix it before I might, before I mark off as, that it, your project is complete. Okay, you won't fail your project uh, due to something like this, uh, unless you have a bunch of other stuff. But this is something you need to pay attention to. Okay, I'm going to be looking. You need to be looking. My eyes are pretty good to recognize when something has a bad contrast ratio. That that should be green instead of orange. Okay, like the. I can't hover over it because if I hover over it, it's going to move my mouse and you're not going to be able to see it anymore. But that exclamation point should not be orange. And I'll show you what that looks like by hovering over this. Okay. This has a contrast ratio of 21. That's the highest contrast ratio you can get. Okay. That's what you want. You want something not, you don't need it that high, but you need it green. It has to be a green check and not an exclamation point. Okay. And I'll show you what that looks like by picking something a little bit different here. So let's say that we have a background color of black instead, okay? And if we do that, you'll see now that we have a 10.63 contrast ratio. This is appropriate. This is legible. It's readable by people that have any, any sort of visual impairment that would prevent them from seeing things with weird contrast ratios. This is much easier on the eyes than this, okay? That's very difficult to read. So make sure that you're looking at stuff like that uh, as you're building your applications out. When you're picking colors, and I'm going to show you sites that you can use to get good color palettes and things like that, um, but make sure that you're paying attention to accessibility, stuff like that. It's very important. Okay. Um, cool. Margin. Okay. Margin is another frequently used property which adds white space around an element. Okay. So I'm going to use this H1 that we've already got. And let's add some margin to this, okay? Let's say margin top, M-A-T, M-A-R-T, to margin top. And let's add a 10 pixel margin to the top of this. Okay. What just happened? Why did it go up? If I added a margin on the top, wouldn't it go down? How do we know? Let's use our inspector tool. Okay. If we click on this, it's going to tell us some pretty, oh my God, that's bright. It's going to tell us right now, when we highlight it, we can see all of this different stuff. Right now, it's been given a default margin of 21.44 pixels. So when we set it to 10, it overrides that and reduces it, making it smaller on the top. Okay, I'll show you by doing. Okay, I uncomment that. You'll now see, now see, you'll now see that this has a margin on the top of 10 pixels and that same default margin of 21.4 pixels on the bottom. Okay, and no margin on the left or right. We can adjust all of these. Let's do margin left of 25 pixels, margin right of five pixels, and margin bottom of 15 pixels. Okay, we're, this is wacky, wacky pants. We're, we got crazy margins all over the place. This is a weird looking element now. Okay, but you can see that each of those has a different margin setup. Okay. The way that you get elements where you want them on the page is not by changing the margin. Okay. All the time. You can add space between elements with margin if you want. Like if I have a, an element here, like these two elements, for example, if I want a little bit of space between these, I can add some margin. But this isn't necessarily the way that you're going to want to do that for everything. Don't use margin for all of your layout choices, okay? Sometimes you're going to want to use Flexbox and containers for that, okay? 
What if I want more space inside of this component? That's where padding comes in. Okay, so if I add some padding to this, let's say padding is gonna be uh, 20 pixels, okay? What this does is it adds padding to the inside of this element so that there's more space between the content and the edge of the container that you've set up, okay? So margin is the outside of the element spacing. Padding is on the inside of the element between the edge of, edges of the element and the content. Nat? Uh, I think this is something that uh, I definitely like found myself tripped up on in the pre-work is the difference between margin and padding. So like not all of your elements are gonna have like a hot pink border. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like to so should we kind of maybe just consider like think about it in our heads as like each of those things has a, like a hot pink border even if it put doesn't it that's I would put it there as I'm building it out like as you're building it out if it helps you to visualize where your elements are give it a hot pink border because I was confused just take it about out like padding versus okay that helps yeah. just pretend there's absolutely. a border even if you don't use it. Yeah, absolutely. Or just, again, during development, add a border in there and just say, I want to see where this element is. This, this, this is actually what I do. <laughs> when I'm figuring out where everything needs to go, I'll throw a, like a, a, like a, I won't necessarily use a three pixel fuchsia border. I'll do, do something a little bit less crazy. But yeah, if this helps you, this is what you should do. Sweet. Thank you. Um, CSS has shorthand properties. So you'll notice here that we did this margin top, margin left, margin right, margin bottom, okay? And this is not how you always wanna write stuff, okay? CSS has some stuff where if I wanna define a margin for all four of my different uh, north, south, east, west things, um, I can do it in one lot, okay? And the way it goes is top, right, bottom, left. So it's gonna be clockwise starting at the top. So if I wanted to achieve this same margin in one line of code, I could do margin, and it would be uh, top is 10 pixels. Um, right is five pixels. Bottom is 15 pixels. Uh, left is 25 pixels, okay? So this line of code is identical to all four of these lines of code because of that shorthand property, okay? I can delete those. The other thing you can do is if you just want to do top and bottom, or uh, excuse me, top, bottom, and left, right, you can do two of these. So if I want to say that the top and bottom margins are 10 and the left, right margins are 25, I can do something like this. And that will set my top and bottom margins to 10 and my left and right margins to 25. So you can do really cool shorthand stuff with this. Okay. Do I expect you to remember that? No. You'll learn more as you play around with this, okay? Uh, there's a you do in here for property discovery. Um, I we're not I do, we don't have enough time for that, so I'm just going to kind of go from here, um, and we'll talk about that at some other point. Actually, we won't. I lied. I'm never going to talk about that again. If you want to look into that stuff, you're more than welcome to do that on your own. Um, I am going to talk more about CSSTricks.com because that's going to be your Bible for Flexbox when we get there next week. Um, but the rest of these are just not things I'm going to talk about. Okay. Um, there are three different ways to add styles to a web page. Okay. There's inline styles, external style sheets, and internal style sheets. Okay. You're going to see a combination of all three of these used across the the um, the program. Um, but there are some that you should use more than others, okay? Inline styling should be used to apply styling to a single element using the style attribute, okay? This breaks our separation of concerns principle, okay? By mixing content with presentation. This means I would be writing CSS inside of my HTML, which is not what I want to do, okay? Can we do this? Yes. Will you see us do this in the future? Yeah, we're going to do it a little bit in React, but we're not going to do it in Unit 1 because in Unit 1, we have a style sheet, we have an HTML element or a HTML file, and we have a JavaScript file. 
Okay, separation of concerns. Don't put CSS inside of your HTML, okay? You're gonna write some CSS rules inside of your JavaScript, but that's a little bit different because that's gonna be dynamically changing the CSS based on different conditions that we set while writing code in JavaScript. That's okay. But what you don't wanna do is use inline styling. That way, when you need to go update something or check something, you're, you need to go to your HTML instead of your CSS, and that's not what you want. Okay. Um, it, it, for example, if I wanted to make this work, I could go in here and um, this is actually going to be a really good example. Let's take a look at what uh, how this works and uh, preferred orders of things. Let's make this H1 uh, the color of green. I'm going to add a style uh, tag to this or attribute to this. And I'm going to say color green. Okay. I have a rule here that makes this green. I have a rule here that makes it orange. Which one has obviously taken priority? The green one, it's screen, right? The green one. So our inline style has taken priority over our style sheet, okay? That's important to know. If you're using inline styling, it will take precedent over any other style sheets you've got set up, okay? That's a good thing to know. Even though we're not going to use inline styling, it's good to know that it will override anything you have in your style sheets if you are using it, okay? Next is external style sheets. Oops. Apparently, we were supposed to do this later. I knew we wouldn't have a lesson that didn't have instructions like that. Oh, well. Um, so the external style sheets are considered best practice for what we're doing, okay? This provides us best separation of concerns uh, along with reusability and maintainability, okay? It's gonna make it easier for us to edit things, easier to maintain things, uh, and just easier to debug, to be honest, okay? External style sheets are separate files with a .css extension and are linked to the document with a link element, which we already talked about, so I'm not going to focus on that. Okay? We already did that. We already did that. Um, the third and final technique is to have an internal style sheet. Okay? This is used by creating a style element inside of uh, the document's head element. So technically, we can have specific internal style sheets that are specific to our HTML files. Again, this is not the preferred way of doing this because you're not separating your concerns. Here, you're doing the same thing by putting styles inside of your HTML, which is absolutely not what you want to do. Okay. And that's where this comes into play is load order matters. Okay. You may need to include multiple CSS style sheets on your web page for for example, when we get to unit two, we're going to have a bunch of different CSS pages, okay, for different, different, uh, we're going to have essentially templates that you'll see, okay? we Maybe you want to add a third-party CSS framework like Bootstrap or something, or have your own custom CSS file, okay? The load order of those CSS style sheets matters, okay? If multiple style sheets reference the same rule, the last one that loads is the one that's going to apply that rule. So if you have the same rule three different places in your code, the last one of those that runs, the last one of those to be loaded is the one that's going to take precedent. Okay. So if, for example, um, I have, and again, this is not something you would do. I'm just going to demonstrate this. Uh, let's make a other style uh, CSS. And I'm going to take this H1 tag and I'm going to put something else in it. So H1 uh, color lime. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of the internal style that we have set up for this. So our H1 is supposed to be orange. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to link that other style sheet here. Okay. So again, you don't need to do this. It's just me demonstrating something. Don't feel like you need to copy all this along but dot slash CSS, other style, okay? So now both of these are loaded. Because I've loaded 
the other style after I've loaded the original one, that's the rule that takes precedent. If I switch them, it'll turn back to orange because it's the load order here that matters. Whichever one of these is loaded second is going to be the one that determines what rules are followed. Okay, so you have to be very careful with this. You're not going to have multiple style sheets in unit one, most likely. Some of you might with like some extra stuff, but it's not going to impact your styling. It's going to impact animations and stuff like that. It won't impact text color. But in unit two, we will. And you got to be really careful about what you've got where. Some of you might use stuff like this in unit one. We'll see. Okay. Delete that. So who wins between, uh, sorry, you have a question. Aria, what's up? Uh, so you would have different style sheets for focusing on different like designs of the page? Like, I don't know. No, um, it's, so when we get into unit two, what you're gonna see is technically we're using these things called templates. And this template right here, for example, for showing the details of a movie, has a CSS style sheet that's associated with just this page, but it also has a CSS style sheet that's associated with the head of the HTML thing. So there's a main style sheet that's loaded for all of the application, and then there's a secondary style sheet that's located or that's loaded just for this specific template. So that's specifically what I'm talking about. Okay. You're not going to have to worry about this until then. And when we get over it, believe me, I'm going to explain this in much more detail than I am right now, because this probably looks terrifying right now. Yeah. But okay. yeah, that's that's the important, that's that's where this turns out to be important down the road. Okay. Who wins between style sheets and inline styling? Inline. Inline, inline correct. What are the three, we, I'm not going to make you answer that. That's petty. Best practice is what? That's, this is important. Internal, external, or inline? Style sheets. Internal uh, style sheets, external style sheets. External. 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 external style sheets, right. Having an external style sheet, not putting your styling in your HTML is best practice. Okay. Um, there's more stuff in here about um, CSS selectors. Uh, I'm... Uh, Yeah, I got to go over this. I'll I'll do this last part and then we'll call it after that because I want you to have a break before we start with the intro to engineering channel. Um, take this code and copy this and put this within the body of your uh, HTML. And you'll see that we've got this fun stuff, okay? Oh, I need to get rid of my style sheets too because that's going to F everything up, okay? should look something like this, okay? Probably a little bit smaller. I'm zoomed in a lot. It's gonna look something like this on your screens. I'm just zoomed in so we can see this. Okay. Uh, we already did that. And we're gonna update this with some basic CSS here. So we're gonna put this inside of our style.css. Okay. This changes our font and it centers our header up here or our H1. Okay. The rest of this lesson, or at least the next big chunk of this lesson, talks about the different selectors that we have access to, which is why this is actually kind of important. I don't want to just kind of gloss over it. But you'll notice that each of these things has a different, have some different properties, right? We have a P tag with an ID of about. We have a div with a class of crazy. We have a div with a class of crazy and a class of super cool. Okay, this we're going to use these different methods to select different CSS or different HTML elements to apply CSS rules to them. Okay, that's how we're going to use CSS for the most part in unit one is by identifying things based on their class or their ID and then going from there. Okay, so if we wanted all H1 and H2 tags, we could do something like this with H1 comma H2. I demonstrated that already. Okay. Let's do this together. We're going to set the margin on the body element to zero 
on all four sides, okay? which is something you'll commonly see done um, because most browsers give a margin to the body element, which we don't want. Okay, so let's do that together. The body element, we want to have a margin on all four sides. Okay, so we can just do margin of what? Zero, zero, zero pixels, zero pixels. Okay, our margin's gone. Also, we're going to give the uh, background of the body element a color of light gray. So background color, light gray, and a height of 200 pixels. We're going to set the margin on the UL elements to zero on all four sides as well. So we go UL, margin. Zero pixels, zero pixels. I think we just do zero pixels too. Let's check that and make sure that that actually worked. I don't think we need the two. Um, let's go here. UL. Margin, yep, there's no margin there. So let's adjust that here and just say that the margin on the body is just zero pixels. That does all four sides. I'm telling you, the developer tools are like, if you're not using these while you're writing code, you're doing it wrong. Okay, You've got to use these developer tools and the little selector wand and stuff to look at stuff while you're writing code or else it's going to take you forever to debug your CSS. Okay, And let's also... Um, Set the text color of all div elements to blue. Okay. So the last thing that is in this that I'm going to cover that's important because there's design tips in here. This, this, you need to read this. Man, for the love of God, you need to read this design tips thing. Okay. This talks about some good patterns to follow, and there's a whole extra supplemental lesson in um, uh, Notion that talks about like how to design stuff appropriately. Okay, there's it's a whole lesson, it's a whole supplemental piece of content that will tell you best practices for design, and it's absolutely worth reading. Okay, it probably explains the whole eight thing that I was talking about earlier. So let's look at a couple more of these things and we'll take a break, okay? If we want to access the value of an ID, okay, select an element by its ID for styling, we're gonna use the hashtag, okay? So let's use the that methodology to take our comments title element, which if we look at, we have this, it's this H3 right here. And I want to take that and I want to set the font to 28 pixels on that element. And I want to select it by its ID. So I see that it has an ID of comments hyphen title. So to select that by its ID, I'm going to do hashtag comments title. And we're going to set the font size to 28 pixels. Okay, And that makes it all big. Same element, let's give it a margin of 10 pixels on the top and bottom and zero on the sides. So here we can do margin and we can do uh, top and bottom 10 pixels and then zero pixels on the sides. Okay, you can do that with the two instead of the yeah, handy shorthand. The other thing that we have access to is the class attribute. Okay. This selects elements that match one of the values that has a class attribute. Okay. Class attribute can accept multiple space separated values. So you see here that this element, this div right here, has a class of crazy and it also has a class of super cool. So you're going to see that lots of your elements, especially if you're dealing with animations, are going to have multiple classes, 
Okay, that is a normal practice. You're not going to find multiple IDs for an element. An element can only ever have one ID, should only ever have one ID, but it can have multiple classes. Okay. So let's go ahead and do this and let's set the border of the LI with a class of cool, super cool rather, to be solid. Okay. This is where this gets specific. Okay. And there's so much more specificity that we can do, but we're looking for. You see that super cool here is a class for this div, and it's also a class for this li. But I want specifically just this li. So knowing that, I can put a rule in here that says I want the li with a class of super cool to have, uh, what does it want? A uh, border that is uh, two pixels solid red and that will just select this if i had changed this to just class of super cool it's going to pick the other thing that has a, a class of super cool tool too okay the li is to say i only want li's with a class of super cool okay this is kind of the beginning to a very very dark rabbit hole of css selectors because there is some crazy shit out there with how you can select stuff Okay, and a lot of that is listed here in the level up. Okay, there are advanced selectors like combinators and some of this stuff, it just gets the pseudo class selectors. So you have the LI of the nth child three hover. Like there's there's a lot in here. And if CSS overwhelms you, do not look at this yet because this is going to scare you away. Okay. Just some stuff in this. This has got some really good level ups in here. This has just recently be, been rewritten. It's really good. But that's kind of where I'm going to call it so we can take a break for the next thing. Okay. I realize it's been a very long day, if you, especially if you've come to the HTML, CSS stuff. So take a break. Um, I'm going to give it an extra five minutes. So let's call it eight minutes from now. We'll get back and we'll do the uh, last thing of the day. Thanks for hanging in there, y'all.